That's, uh, as you can see from the writing at the top, a man named Noel. Noel um, was a rancher that we went to interview in um, June 2004. And he, he breeds chickens, uh, I presume he still does. Um, and he had a strange incident in 2003. What happened was that I mentioned how some of the people, you know, they're not particularly rich, unfortunately, on the island. And as you can see, um, there's this canopy here. That's, and some fencing there. That's where his little enclosure, where he kept the chickens, started. And it kind of went round the back of the property here to for 20, 30 feet. Um, he woke up one morning to find all of his chickens in their cages, but dead. Um, now, of course, you know, if, for example, you've got a huge sprawling ranch, and your animals are killed in the middle of the night and they're a quarter of a mile away. You're not going to hear any noise, any screaming or anything like that from them. You would imagine if somebody's chickens were killed right on your doorstep, that's the steps up to his house and that's his little ranch area there. You would imagine 20 or 30 chickens being killed. You would soon wake up and be charging down the stairs to find out what the hell was going on. Um, and yet this is something else that we get in a lot of Chupacabra reports that the the creature seems to be able to operate in complete silence. That it seems to be able to strike in a very stealthy, predatory fashion, but doesn't leave any calling cards in terms of its presence, and certainly doesn't wake people up from a, from a dead sleep. It seems very, very cautious and creepy, almost, as one of the witnesses described it to us. Well, Noel woke up this one particular morning, went out to feed the chickens, and as I said, found them all dead. The way his, his little farm was set up, each of the chickens was kept in a separate cage. Um, and instead of you know, just being tied by a little piece of string or whatever, they got kind of an intricate lock where you had to pick it up, push it one way, pull it down, and then push it the other way, something like that. And whatever had got into the cages had actually opened the cages and torn them apart, as you might imagine a wild animal would. So whatever had opened the, the, the gates had done so with a form of intelligence and dexterity in terms of being able to use its fingers. Um, now, as I said, all the animals were killed, all had the characteristic two puncture wounds on the neck. Um, some of them had a, had a hole in the side, and I think something like 30% had had the liver removed. No other organs, just the liver. And it wasn't a case that they were sliced open. It was the fact that something had had found, knew where to insert a, like a cut, if you like, where the liver would be, and had literally kind of taken it out. And that was actually referred to in the veterinarian reports. And that was certainly something that we found to be very, very weird, the idea that a wild animal would know where to go for the liver. Um, you know, if we're talking about an animal with no, I guess, high degree of, of intelligence, shall we say. So that was, that was like a really weird angle, the, the fact that, you know, that whatever had done these killings had done so in complete silence, that um, it seemed to know how to open the, the gates to the, to the cages, remove the liver, remove blood, etc., etc. And That was probably the strangest of all the cases I've ever investigated on Puerto Rico. Um, and again, unfortunately, you know, I think he was hoping we could provide some answers, but in many respects, like a lot of these cases, it, it creates and provokes more questions than it does answers. That um, is one of the many caves that are on the island of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has this extensive series of cave systems that um, extend from way down at the bottom of the El Yonqui rainforest, right pretty much to the top of it. And this one, as you can see, that's one of the guys who went with, that's, that's a pretty high cave. But through there, you've got lots of little offshoots and little tunnels and things like that. And I went in one of them, which was kind of over this side somewhere. Um, and it was probably about this high to start with, maybe about eight feet. And I managed to get in with a flashlight for about, probably about a quarter of a mile. And by that point, it was sort of down to here and full of water. And you just, you just couldn't get any further. But certainly these tunnels, if you know where to find them and, and where they are, they extend all across the island. And, and one of the theories is that possibly the Chupacabra, that they use these tunnels either to 
I guess, criss crisscross the island without actually coming out into the open, that maybe they know their way around these tunnel systems and can, and can negotiate them in that fashion and not have to sort of show themselves in daylight. Um, of course, it's just a theory. Um, like a lot of areas on Puerto Rico, this is kind of hazardous going into these caves because at the very top you have a lot of bats and uh, the guide who was with us on the first occasion said, when you're on the island and you're um, in the caves, if you go into the caves, don't look up because if the bats kind of spit down on you and it gets into your mouth or your eye, a lot of them have got rabies. So you have to be uh, taken off to the local hospital to have uh, rabies injections like uh, Ozzy Osbourne did when he uh, <laughs> bit the head off the rats. And, <laughs> and it's not fun having rabies injections because they go straight into your stomach. So. <laughs> Um, so that was one of the hazards they told us about. Another one was that, for example, there was um, a primate lab on the island that was doing research into the HIV virus back in the 80s. And so apparently a number of these monkeys escaped into the wild. And so they said, you know, if you see any of these little friendly looking monkeys, whatever you do, don't approach them. You know, <laughs> one of them bite you could be in real trouble. So uh, never mind the chupacabras, you may have sort of HIV infected monkeys, rabid bats and who knows what else to deal with so <laughs> you need to go prepared if you're going to look for some of these things um, but you know with the cave system it's kind of intriguing that the reason they chose this cave was because several um, ranches which basically if you went down if you imagine going down the El Yonke rainforest at a high angle like this you actually came to several farms at the bottom where a lot of attacks had occurred over the course of about a three month period so you could quite easily imagine it going back and forth, back and forth, and, and hiding out. Now, that um, is another civil defence guy we spoke with. Um, if you're at the back, you probably won't see it, but the, some of you at the front, I'm sure, can see like a head uh, with some spikes on the back, where he did a drawing, or one of the witnesses did a drawing of the creature that um, he'd seen on his property. Um, let's just go on to the next one. You'll see he's got this kind of thick book there um, of reports that he collected over the years. And these are all collected for the government, the government civil defence unit. And um, they actually have them on file now in an archive in one of their buildings. It's actually not a big building at all. It's not even as big as this. But you can go there and look at um, some of these records now. And he, he kept his own copies. Um, this is from the 2005 trip I went on to. And with that guy's a Canadian film name, uh, filmmaker named Paul Kimball, who I went with in uh, the latter part of 2005. And this was really, I guess, like a, a second trip out to the island, really to try and you know, follow up on the 2004 reports that we'd investigated. And um, one of the things I found is that every time I go to Puerto Rico, you find new strands to the story, new aspects, new cases, and things like that, and, and also new theories. Um, most of the theories relating to the chupacabra that I've found when I've gone to the island, there's, there's sort of four main theories. One is that the chupacabra is an unknown animal um, that the science just literally hasn't classified in any way, shape or form. There have been a lot of UFO reports on the island of Puerto Rico and some people think it could be some sort of alien creature. Um, other people suggest the idea of like a giant bat or something along those lines. Then there are a lot of people, and I actually don't subscribe to this theory, the, the idea that it could be some sort of genetic mutation, like a secret government experiment. Um, you know, I think governments certainly do weird things scientifically today, and who knows what's going to be around the corner with gene splicing, but, you know, I think it's kind of difficult to imagine mutating, you know, a little friendly monkey into a vicious killing machine like the Chupacabra. That might be something cool for, you know, a Saturday night horror film, but... I'm not sure we can do that just yet, at least. Um, and then there's one intriguing theory that um, I don't think a lot of people have dug into this, but there's actually like a lot of occult-type groups on the island of Puerto Rico, and some of them do blood sacrifice rituals. And the theory is put forward that perhaps some of these groups have been using the Chupacabra legend as a cover for their blood rituals, and then if anybody gets hot on their trail, it can be blamed on the chupacabra and you know it allows these cult type groups to, to stay in the background so that was actually five theories not four so i'm not i can't count properly so <laughs> um so but you, these are the theories you tighten your care 
give you tend to find every time you speak to the people. And I think the most, the most popular theories that I found at least are that it could be an unknown animal or, it, or it's some sort of alien creature. Those are the ones that certainly are quite high in the minds of the locals when you get to speak to them. Now, you know, how we, how we can resolve that, if we can resolve it, I don't know. I think a lot of it is sort of dependent upon um, if we have like a, a major development in terms of finding one of these creatures maybe. Excuse me. That's, that's a guy, as you can see from that name, Pucho. And Pucho is a guy we interviewed in 2005 also. Um, now, I mentioned earlier in the lecture that the, the Chupacabra, some people have talked about it having wings, some people have talked about it just having like this, I guess, small, muscular, monkey-like body. Um, but also that there have been reports of other types of creature that might fall into the same category as the Chupacabra, but might not. And certainly this guy, uh, Pucho, his case, potentially at least, could, I guess it could fall into the Chupacabra category, maybe it's something else. But he had this experience in late 2004. Um, his house is in a little village just to the right of where the photograph's taken. And the village really is just one long street surrounded by the, the rainforest on either side with maybe 15 small shack-like houses. And... He was walking home one evening, like 8 o'clock, and he heard a big rustling in the trees to his right and said he saw this creature sort of loom out of the trees and almost like fall out of the tree towards the, the hillside that ran down the other side of the road. It was a really steep hill. And he said it was almost like, you know, if you imagine somebody on a hang glider taking off and then using the, the currents on the side of the hill to, to get up into the air. And he said that's exactly what the... The creature seemed to do. It seemed to have the ability to, I guess, glide almost and then use the thermals um, to take to the air. And he didn't know what this is, was, excuse me, never seen anything like it before, um, but said that several days later one of his neighbours reported a number of farm animals having been savagely mutilated and killed. And he suspected that, that somehow there was a connection that certainly said his village had never experienced chupacabra attacks before, to the best of his knowledge, um, and he felt it was way too much of a coincidence that these mutilations of the animals had occurred only a couple of days after he had this particular sighting of this large winged creature. I think three were for one location on the island, but two were on, from completely the other side of the island, which suggested, you know, if they were true, then this creature had sort of a wide range of area across the island that it was negotiating. Um, again, as to what this was, as to whether or not it has a direct connection with the Chupacabra, we don't know. The problem is that the three initial reports did, uh, were made in the same place where a lot of the original Chupacabra reports surfaced from. So again, this makes it kind of confusing as to are we dealing with one creature or are we dealing with several creatures or maybe two creatures or is it the case that because a lot of the sightings have been made at night and people are getting fleeting glimpses, you know, it's, it's kind of confusing to the witnesses even what they're seeing and they're just getting a fragmentary image that then they try and relate to us maybe a year or two later down the line. Now, I said, uh, you know, we find the Chupacabra. I, I, I kind of put that picture up because uh, if, unless you, if you're near the back, you might not see it, but that's... That's me, there's John, and there's the Chupacabra between us. And it's actually the first and only time I've ever had a six-pack, so I'm kind of proud. <laughs> I'm kind of proud of that picture. So. <laughs> but I put that up because it's, it's, it serves to show how the Chupacabra has kind of become ingrained in Puerto Rican society and culture. Because, um, you know, in, in the same way that, for example, the town of Roswell in New Mexico has embraced the UFO legend is very much like a, a whole aspect of the tourist industry there. Certainly the people on Puerto Rico have done exactly the same. And you can go into any little town, which is, this was taken in a little town um, in Puerto Rico. You can buy t-shirts, buttons, baseball caps, coats, jackets, you know, you name it, you can buy it, mugs, coffee mugs, 
Um, you can buy it, and it's got a picture of the Chupacabra on it, or you know, something similar to that, or I survived the Chupacabra, that, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you have to also be aware that when, you, any, when an animal on the island of Puerto Rico is killed, because the whole phenomenon has become such a cultural, mythological thing, that there is often a tendency for people to say, oh, it must have been the Chupacabra. Now, you know, that doesn't take away from the fact that there is a core body of, of unidentified, unresolved cases. Um, but we need to be aware of the fact that sometimes animals on the island of Puerto Rico are killed by wild dogs. There are a lot of packs of wild dogs roaming around. You know, if you go through any of the little towns, you can, you see them. You know, it's almost like a New York street gang with their flint knives or whatever. That's how they look, the vicious looking dogs, you know, uh, you know the, the big one's the leader and you've got the little ones following behind and you can just look at them and you know, they, they look mean. And so certainly some of the attacks I think can be attributed to things like that, but as I said, because you have this mythology on the island, this cultural embracing of the, of the phenomenon that it can, I think, sometimes elevate reports beyond um, you know, the actual figure, shall we say, what, which can be attributed to the Triple Cabra. Now, that picture, uh, it's actually got a date there of 92 because uh, the camera screwed up and I didn't know how to remove it. So. <laughs> um, but that is a valley. Um, it's actually at the very top of the rainforest, but it's kind of, it becomes like a valley and as you can see the clouds coming down very low there. I mentioned that some people believe the Chupacabra could be some sort of alien creature. Well, one of the... Um, one of the stories that's a long-standing story on the island is that in 1957 something crashed in that particular area um, that some people suggest was a UFO. Now, this this story me and John investigated when, in, when we went in 2004. We were never really able to resolve what it was that had happened, but certainly we were able to speak to a number of people who at the time were in their 20s and 30s and were now sort of 70s and 80s and some of their children who said they remembered the the crash happening and that military people from Puerto Rico and from the US came in and that a part of the area was closed off and there was also talk about the ecology being changed afterwards with fish in the local rivers having been found mutated and animals you know when animals were giving birth to offspring that the the offspring were found uh, or given birth dead or deformed and almost, you know, like some sort of radiation in the water type scenario. So it seems that something happened and a lot of the locals do feel it was kind of like a, I guess like a Puerto Rican Roswell in many respects. And um, unfortunately, you know, being from so long ago from the 50s, there weren't really that many people to speak with, but everybody who we were able to speak with were, was able to kind of add a strand to this. Now, whether or not that can be taken any further to this day. I don't know, but um, you know, this is one of these things that kind of puts the Chupacabra stories in a UFO context as well. Um, also being rumors from the island surface time and again that the US military supposedly captured a number of Chupacabra in the 1990s. Um, that's part of a, a military base on the island where According to the rumours, several of these chupacabra were taken and supposedly put in very steep, uh, large, reinforced steel cages and transferred to the US mainland. Again, you know, all, all I can do is tell you that the stories are well known on the island of Puerto Rico and there are a number of people who have made first-hand claims about supposedly seeing them in these cages, second-hand witnesses who claim to be married to military people, police officers who knew about these incidents and talked about them. Um, so again, it's another aspect of the subject suggesting that you know, these aren't just simply figments of the imagination and maybe elements of the government or military know far more than we do. Um, 